Your Amazing Milk, the evidence-based podcast about breast milk from a dealer for you. Maybe your life has just turned upside down because you've had a baby and you have lots of questions. Or you've heard that breastfeeding is good for babies and you just want to know more about it. I'm Katie and in each episode, I talk about the processes going on in a woman's body, about the composition of breast milk and its effects, as well as tackling those myths and facts. Amazing, fascinating, and all backed up by science. In this episode, is it true that breastfeeding changes your breasts in ways that you didn't want? Do women with bigger breasts actually have more milk? Are there many women who can't breastfeed at all? Does breast milk actually always taste the same? And when did us mammals who can breastfeed first come into being? Hello and welcome to the first episode of our podcast. Let's start with something important. Because one thing must be said, your breasts deserve respect. Over the centuries, breasts have captured the imaginations of artists and sculptors, inspired writers, poets and musicians, and been celebrated as symbols of fertility and femininity in cultures across the world. Yet most of us never realise just how much they are capable of. Like the rest of your organs, your breasts started forming when you were an embryo. But while most other organs are already fairly mature by birth, breasts stay rudimentary until puberty hormones spark them into growth. As they expand, new cells form and your breasts undergo an internal mini remodeling with every monthly menstrual cycle. But extraordinarily, your breasts only become fully mature during pregnancy and lactation when they start to remodel themselves on a larger scale. As early as week four of your pregnancy, a complex web of branching milk ducts and milk producing cells called lactocytes start forming in your breasts. From around 15 weeks, those lactocytes begin working. And from around week 22, they start to produce milk. By the time your baby is born, your breasts may be up to 46% bigger than they were before pregnancy. Alternatively, they may reserve their main growth spurt for after your baby has arrived. So be prepared. But hey, small breasts don't mean a small milk supply. Just as large ones don't guarantee you'll be overflowing. Research into breast size and milk production shows the amount of milk you make depends on the amount of glandular tissue you have, rather than the overall volume of your breasts. Speaking of milk, here's our first Did You Know? Did you know? Breast milk is live. Your breast milk contains a spectrum of live bioactive components, elements that affect different functions in the body. Added together, they mean your milk has a role far, far beyond nutrition alone, with medicinal qualities that play a crucial part in your baby's health now and later in life. You will hear a lot of exciting things about this in the following episodes. I promised at the beginning that I would talk about myths and facts. Who hasn't heard them? Often, well-intentioned statements can make us feel quite insecure, precisely because we don't know whether they are true. Here comes our first myth or fact. Myth or fact. Many women can't breastfeed. It's a myth. The vast majority of women are physically capable of breastfeeding, as long as they have the help and support they need. In Norway, 96.6% of mums are breastfeeding their babies to some extent at four weeks. Scientists haven't agreed on a definitive figure for the percentage of women who can physically breastfeed, 
But if Norway can achieve such high rates, it stands to reason that, with similar support, other countries could too. But there is a rare condition called mammary hypoplasia, where women don't have enough of the right type of breast tissue to produce milk. And if you're taking certain medications, breastfeeding may not be recommended. But most breasts, whatever they look like, are equipped for the job. Good news, huh? And here comes another frequently heard claim that we have investigated for its truthfulness. Myth or fact? Breastfeeding makes your breasts sag. It's a myth. That's not what the plastic surgeons say, and uh, they should know. They tell us that while the risk of sagging increases with each pregnancy, they found little difference between the breasts of women who breastfed and those who didn't. Sagging, or breastosis, to give it its scientific name, is likely to be caused by a loss of skin elasticity due to pregnancy itself, as well as factors such as age, history of significant weight loss and smoking. So if the risk of sagging is putting you off breastfeeding, now you know it won't make it any worse. More good news, and on it goes with stories about breasts. Now history and science come together. I call this part the anatomy of the breast, or what a mess hot wax got us into. We only discovered the full structure of the lactating breast during the 21st century. Although doctors and surgeons have known the anatomy of most other organs for hundreds of years, it wasn't until 2005 that groundbreaking research carried out at the University of Western Australia established how the breast creates, stores and delivers milk. For more than 160 years, medical knowledge of the lactating breast was based largely on Sir Astley Cooper's work in 1840. He injected different coloured melted wax into the milk ducts of deceased nursing mothers and believed it was these ducts that stored the milk as the hot wax stretched and pooled in them before cooling. In 2005, Dr Donna Geddes and her team found no evidence of the lactiferous sinuses described by Cooper, which meant large volumes of milk aren't stored in the ducts. Now we know the ducts are actually narrow tubes that carry the milk to the nipple, usually two or three millimetres wide. These ducts can expand by 68% during a feed when the milk is flowing through them. The milk is actually stored in your breast tissue in small sacs, which cluster into groups and are connected to the main ducts via small canals. The researchers also discovered women could have as few as four ductal openings on each nipple and an average of nine rather than the 15 to 20 previously thought. A lot has happened in the recent history of science, but research has not only been done in the field of breast anatomy, but exciting studies have also been published on breast milk. Did you know? Your food flavours your milk. Your diet during pregnancy influences the flavour of your amniotic fluid. Once your baby is born, the food you eat will also affect the taste of your milk. Experiencing lots of flavours through your milk can enhance your baby's enjoyment of different tastes later when you start introducing solids. You think dinosaurs are exciting? Ha! Here come the mammals. The first species to count as a mammal lived around 310 million years ago, before the time of the dinosaurs. They laid eggs, but fed their hatchlings milk. However, these animals didn't have breasts. Their milk oozed through their skin via nippleless ducts. What's more, 
The primary purpose of this milk was probably to protect the newborn's immune system, rather than being a food. Over millennia, the ducks evolved into the complicated system of mammary glands that pretty well all mammals possess today. The exception is the small group of five monotremes, egg-laying mammals, found in Australia and New Guinea, which include the duck-billed platypus and spiny anteater, which still excrete milk through their skin. The mother's milk of every species is tailored exactly to their offspring's needs and development. For instance, because monotremes hatchlings lick the milk from their mother's underbelly, the milk contains a unique antibacterial protein to protect them from any infections on the skin. What is absolutely fascinating is the connection between the living conditions and the time period in which the young are fed with milk. Hooded seals, which give birth on unstable ice sheets in the North Atlantic, lactate for just four days. Their milk is 61% fat, making it one of the most energy-rich milks in nature and allows their pups to build a layer of blubber quickly before they enter the cold water to escape polar bears. Orangutans, meanwhile, breastfeed for an extraordinary eight years, the longest lactation period of any mammal. Recently, scientists discovered the orangutan's feeding pattern is cyclical, with their young increasing their milk intake whenever there's a lack of fruit to eat. But because the human brain is far, far more complex than the next smartest animal's brain, human breast milk is more complex too. And that's not all. Human babies are much more helpless and immature at birth than most other mammals. They can't stand up and walk like calves or lambs can, and they won't be able to cope independently in a few short months like a puppy or kitten. Indeed, your baby will continue to need your love, care and protection for many years to come. Other mammals are born with their brains much closer to adult size and complexity. Even chimpanzees, our closest evolutionary cousins, are born with brains that are more than 40% of their adult size. Your newborn's brain is less than 30% of its adult size. Scientists estimate a woman would need to be pregnant for 18 to 21 months for her baby's brain to be as developed as a baby chimp's brain. But a toddler's head would be too large to pass through a woman's birth canal, which may be why human babies are born with relatively immature brains. What does all this have to do with your breast milk? Well, it explains why it has different ingredients and properties to other animals' milks. Breast milk doesn't just fuel your baby's growth. It's also vital for her brain development, a huge amount of which takes place outside the womb. This is why the first three months of a baby's life are sometimes referred to as the fourth trimester. In a later episode, you'll learn more about how breast milk contributes to your baby's brain development. And breast milk can do much more. Did you know? Breast milk contains stem cells. What are stem cells? Stem cells are incredible as they are capable of both self-renewal and developing into different types of tissue. Scientists are still unravelling the possible function and benefits of these cells in breast milk, which remain a mystery for now. However, studies suggest they could migrate into your baby's bones, fatty tissue and liver and brain and may offer them some sort of protection. These stem cells also have amazing potential in other areas. Scientists are investigating whether they could be used to treat cancers or to help repair and regenerate damaged or diseased organs, all without the ethical problems of using embryonic stem cells. Even more cells. Huge numbers of the cells that line the ducts and lobes of the breast are also shed into the milk. Why? 
we just don't know at the moment. What we do know is that immune cells with a protective function also accompany them on their journey into the milk. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. Thank you for being with us. And one more thing to take away, just for you. A little reminder. Put breastfeeding in your birth plan. Be clear that even if the delivery doesn't go as smoothly as you hope, you want the healthcare professionals to do all they can to make breastfeeding work, including ensuring skin-to-skin contact with your baby after birth, if possible. In the next episode, you'll learn why skin-to-skin is so important. This was Your Amazing Milk, the evidence-based podcast about breast milk. From Medela, for you. The references to the studies used for this podcast can be found at medela.com forward slash ebook.